The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Commencing with our video Bible reading number 52 in the book of Acts, we are resuming the storyline here in Acts chapter 16, verse 11. At this point, we have Paul traveling along with Silas. They picked up Timothy along the way. And now Luke has also joined the party. And they are traveling from Troas on the northwest coast of Asia across to Macedonia because Paul has seen a vision of a man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us. So Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. <clears throat> reading from the English Standard Version. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So they have sailed from Troas, the, again, western seacoast of modern Turkey, north, northwest, and made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis, and then to Philippi. From the north coast of modern Turkey, they sailed west, hitting Samothrace and Neapolis. Luke here rightly describes the duration of the journey. This is a very quick journey when you are westbound. He's later gonna mention the same journey in the opposite direction, and it's a much longer journey in the opposite direction, as he also notes in chapter 20, because you don't have the same favorable winds and currents when you are eastbound as you have westbound. So he's accurate on that detail of his travel log uh, something we can appreciate here, and showing that he is indeed someone who was a participant in this voyage. So Thamothrace was an island which made a safe overnight harbor and stopping place for ships in the northern Aegean. Rather than sailing at night with the risks involved in that, they would sail one day to Thamothrace and the next day cross over to, uh, to um, Macedonia. And Neapolis was the seaport in Macedonia, for Philippi, which was the major city there, about 10 miles away from Neapolis. <clears throat> Luke rightly describes Philippi both as a major city of the district of Macedonia and as a Roman colony. All of his details and his vocabulary are historically accurate and spot on down to the, the smallest detail of nomenclature here. Macedonia had been a starting point some four centuries earlier Macedonia had been a starting point of the kingdom of Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, and the city of Philippi was named after him. As a Roman colony, it was governed like Rome and apart from regional authorities, not under a regional governor like the cities of, uh, of, pa of Palestine were. And as a Roman colony, it had many retired Roman legionaries, a lot of Roman soldiers in the population who were retired. On the other hand, as noted indirectly in verse 13, there were very few Jews in Philippi. In terms of geography, with the passage from Troas in Asia to Philippi in Macedonia, our troop of preachers here has crossed from Asia to Europe in terms of the way the geography is reckoned. We've gone now from Asia to Europe for the first time in the, in the Acts account. Luke here in Acts 16:11 and following is providing our first report of a convert in Europe and our first record of setting up a European church. But it still is all part of the Roman world, part of the Mediterranean world, part of the Roman world. Acts 16, verse 12, the latter, latter part of that verse, we remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath we went out. So they had some days probably involved in getting acquainted with the city, looking the city over, learning where things were, learning their way around and finding some place to stay. All of these, just uh, the minor chores that would be involved for the first several days. And no doubt they learned, <clears throat> if they hadn't already known, that there was no Jewish synagogue in the city because the population of Jews there was small. 
So on the Sabbath, rather than going to a synagogue, they went to what would be a traditional place of prayer going all the way back to the days of the Babylonian captivity. They went out to a typical gathering place for small groups of Jews, which was the riverside, in this case on the Gangetes River, outside the city gate. And Luke wrote that they supposed there was a place of prayer there. Apparently, in their exploration of the city in the days before, they had not encountered Jews. They just assumed that there would be Jews on the Sabbath in that location. Although we can surmise that they would have looked for Jews in their uh, getting acquainted with the city, but they went on speculation that there would be a Jewish gathering for prayer on the Sabbath there. The lack of a synagogue here suggests that there were fewer than 10 observant Jewish married men in the community, a small Jewish community in Philippi. Luke described those who gathered by the riverside as women who had come together for prayer. And again, that points to the fact that the Jewish population in Philippi was small, very small. It doesn't seem to have been, there there don't seem to have been any leading men in this community at all. And the one woman who had come to the riverside for prayer that we specifically learn about had a home in the area, but wasn't from there and wasn't even Jewish. The first church in geographical Europe began with a group of women gathered for prayer by the river. And of course, that's alluded to in a a number of songs, and it's a a common kind of theme down by the, the riverside. Went down to the river to pray and so forth. Acts chapter 16, verse 14, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. That's in a region known as Lydda. But this woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira was there in Philippi as a seller of purple goods. And she is described by Luke as a worshiper of God. And again, Luke is careful in his language. He knows the difference between being Jewish and being a worshiper of God. Thyatira was a city in Asia, which again is modern Turkey, mentioned along with seven churches, Ephesus being one of them, being seven churches to whom the book of Revelation was initially sent. Thyatira, along with the other six, is mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. And the specific message to the church at Thyatira begins in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Lydia here was a businesswoman dealing in purple goods, which were a well-known product of Thyatira. Thyatira was famous for its dye industry and especially famous for their purple dyes and the, the purple fabric that came from there. So she is pictured as a successful businesswoman. No indication that there is a man, no clue as to how old she was or any of those kinds of things. She is a businesswoman who is also a worshiper of God. This puts Lydia into the same category as Cornelius back in Acts chapter 10, verse 2. That's what Cornelius was. He was a worshiper of God, but not converted, not fully converted to Judaism. She was, he was a Gentile. She here was a Gentile who had not fully converted to Judaism, but did worship the God of Israel and did follow the moral ethical teachings that are contained in the Old Testament. Continuing in Acts 16, verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The instruction was by Paul, but as in many previous instances in Acts, the Lord's hand is seen in the success of the word here, the Lord empowering his word, the spirit working through the word. We don't have a specific explanation of exactly how the Lord opened her heart, only that he did. On that day, at that time, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Perhaps it was a series of events. Perhaps it was the sunrise that particular morning. Perhaps it was the birds singing in the trees. Perhaps it was the flow of the river. Perhaps it was the spirit leading Paul to say just exactly the right words at the right moment in time. But by whatever means, the Lord opened her heart. He didn't give her a conversion experience per se, but he opened her heart so that she'd pay attention to what Paul said. And she was brought to conviction through the words of the gospel. Whatever mechanism the spirit used, it was the working of the spirit within a heart that was willing to be opened. And the Lord did that so that she would listen, really hear what Paul was saying, whatever mechanism was involved by the Spirit. Several years after this episode, Paul requested in his letters to the Colossian church and the Ephesian church that the brethren would pray, as it puts it in Ephesians 6, 19, pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Paul asked the Christians 
to pray for his effective speaking, that he would have the right words in the circumstances of his imprisonment in Rome at that time when he was given opportunity in various circumstances there to preach to his jailers, to the Praetorian Guard, to the emperor himself and to his court. It's right and good to pray still for the Lord to open hearts and give words to proclaim the mystery of the gospel of Christ. Acts chapter 16, verse 15, and after she was baptized, and that was in response to what Paul preached, after she was baptized and her household as well, she heard Paul's words with an open heart, and she was baptized, just as those who heard the word in Jerusalem, Acts 2, 38 and following, and they were baptized, as those in Samaria in the 8th chapter of Acts, as the Ethiopian eunuch in the 8th chapter of Acts, as Paul himself, instructed by Ananias in Damascus, was baptized when he was explained the good news of Jesus. As Cornelius' household, even after the Spirit had descended upon them, accepted the preaching of the good news, and that group was baptized. Not only Lydia here, but her household, as had been the case with those who were gathered to hear the proclamation in the house of Cornelius several years before this. They might have been family members. That household might have been family members. It might have included servants or employees. We don't have specifics here. But this is consistent with previous examples, including all those, again, who gathered in Cornelius' house to hear the message of Peter. Lydia and her household believed, accepted the message, and she and they were baptized into Christ. Acts chapter 16, verse 15 continues that now Lydia urged us, she urged us, again, noting us, Luke is part of the party, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now, Paul may have been hesitant. Paul and his companions, a group of men, may have been hesitant to stay in this woman's household. We have accounts of Elijah and Elisha, who both had a room on the roof of, a, of the house, a widow in Zarephath in the case of Elijah, and a wealthy married woman in the case of Elisha, and they ministered to the prophets. And as Jesus said, if you, if you give a cup of water to a prophet in my name, then you'll receive a prophet's reward. She has that same kind of spirit. This newly converted disciple demonstrated good works by offering hospitality. Hospitality is one of those things that's listed as a good work for the follower of Christ. Hospitality to the band of preachers. And she was apparently insistent on doing so. She had a household, she didn't live alone, but she was insistent that they do so, and so she persuaded them. So Lydia's house then became a center, at least for a while, of the new church and gospel preaching in the Macedonian city of Philippi. Turning to Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24, I'm gonna read again from the English Standard Version, Acts 16, verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So they're going to the place of prayer, presumably down by the riverside. Maybe it's the Sabbath, maybe it's an everyday occurrence. The place of prayer might have been a handy place for interacting with people coming to the gate of the city, the riverside outside the gate. Might have been a convenient place for catching people who were coming out to wash clothes or get water or things of that nature. Perhaps the church continued to use that same location as a place of outreach on the Sabbath, a place of assembly on the first day of the week, a place of prayer. Perhaps it was just a matter of it being a good place to encounter other people. So here we have a slave girl and her unfortunate circumstances as property of owners who used her 
malady, the spirit that was afflicting her in some way, who used her malady for their own profit, is noted in this description. And make no mistake about it, what she had was a malady and not a gift. This was not a privileged position for her to have this spirit, which is translated for us as a spirit of divination. The Greek word here, it was a spirit of python, which might not resonate with us, but the divination, this spirit of divination, it was a spirit of python, spelled just like the snake. From the NIV study Bible notes, just a, a quick brief summary here, the python was a mythical snake worshiped at Delphi. Now, yes, we have a snake that we call a, a python, but this comes from the mythical snake of wisdom associated with Apollo. A mythical snake worshiped at Delphi. You maybe have heard of the Oracle at Delphi, which was a place where women would go into some sort of, of altered state of mind, some sort of trance, and would utter oracles for people who came and, and made offerings and so forth. The python was a mythical snake worshiped at Delphi and associated with the Delphic Oracle. The term python came to be used of the persons through whom the python spirit supposedly spoke. Since such persons spoke involuntarily, the term ventriloquist was used to describe them. And that term actually comes up in the Greek Bible, the Septuagint of the Old Testament, in reference to fortune tellers. They are referred to as ventriloquists, speaking with a voice not their own, speaking by having the, uh, the strings pulled as though they're a puppet of someone else. So when Luke uses the word python here to describe this spirit, he is specifically saying this is a demonic spirit, a spirit associated with paganism that is speaking through this woman, a spirit whose uh, engagement is forbidden in scripture in the Old Testament. Remember that Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 addressed the connection between demons and pagan worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 and 21, he says, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. So pagan idols invoke demons. What they sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord in the table of demons. So Luke is drawing a connection for us between pagan mysticism and the spirit that infested this slave girl, that she was infested with a spirit of Python, a spirit of pagan divination. And this is not a positive thing in any way, form, or fashion. Fortune-telling mysticism, these things are not spiritually neutral. They're associated directly with demonic activity. This girl's affliction, causing language and behavior that was saleable on the part of her onus, of her owners, it, apparently, this is still saleable today because there is a, an entire multi-billion dollar industry that caters to fortune telling and, and horoscopes and all kinds of things that involve these same kinds of ideas and demonic activity. There are vast marketing techniques. Um, there are drugs that are used to alter mental states. There are uh, supposedly rituals and routines you can go through uh, the, uh, the practice of yoga in India involves getting into an altered state of mind. The practice of meditation in the, uh, in the uh, Far East involves getting an altered state of mind. All of these things are connected with these same kinds of behaviors that Luke is alluding to here. Supposed power or glimpses of the future and mystical experiences. And this was a bad thing. So in Acts chapter 16, verse 17, this went on for a period of time and She's following Paul and us and crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God. Now, that's a true testimony. The slave girl's testimony by the demonic spirit is similar to the testimony of demons on several occasions in Jesus' ministry. It was a demon who first acclaimed Jesus as being the Son of God. But he didn't want the testimony of demons, and he persistently cast out those demons and silenced them when doing so, commanded them not to speak and cast them out of those who were speaking by the influence of the demons, even when they acknowledged that he was the son of God. Jesus deplored their testimony and Jesus cast them out. That was part of his mission to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to overcome the devil's work in their lives. And here we are 20 years after Jesus' resurrection and very far from the land of Israel. And Paul and company again are dealing with the same kind of testimony the testimony of a demon, that these men serve the Most High God. 
The testimony that Paul and Luke and the others were servants of the Most High God was true. The language goes back to Melchizedek in Genesis 14, 18, referring to God as God Most High. That goes back to Melchizedek in Genesis 14, 18 and following. It's the language of Balaam in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 16. It's a typical way of God being described among the nations. Deuteronomy 32, he is the God over the nations, God Most High. God is persistently described that way, referring to his authority over the nations in antiquity. However, even though it was a true description and a true testimony, it was not a desirable testimony as the Lord has no partnership with demons, as Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 down in there, where he talks about the temple of God and idols and the lack of commonality between them. So Paul was bothered by the daily repetition of this aberrant testimony, even though it was true. It got attention he wasn't desiring. This wasn't the way they wanted to preach the message of Christ. It was, in fact, an impediment to their work and not a benefit. And so, after some time, he rebuked the Spirit in Jesus' name. No one had asked him to do this, but he did it in the name of Jesus. The authority of Jesus over demons was not diluted by paganism, was not diluted by time, was not diluted by distance, and the demon promptly came out of the girl. But in verse 19, when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they saw the change, and they weren't happy because her affliction was to their profit, and that's what slavery is all about. But her affliction was to their profit. And consequently, they seized Paul and Silas, and perhaps Paul had known that this would cause trouble, but enough was enough. And the spirit of the Lord was there because the Lord responded to his request and the demon was cast out. But these men seized them, the owners of the slave girl, and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So the rulers, according to custom, were gathered in the marketplace and they could be approached for matters of justice and questions, issues, settling matters of the community. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, so they brought them to the magistrates, the rulers of the city in the marketplace. This slave girl, as a slave, was a commodity to her owners. They had no interest in uh, the state of her life or her comfort or anything of that sort. She was a piece of property, and her malady was valuable to them. They had no care for her. Their care was only for the loss of profit. Not only that, they had no care for the power. They had no care for her testimony that these men were representatives of God Most High, and they had no care for the fact that Paul had the authority to cast out a demon spirit, a spirit of python, this this spirit of divination, that didn't impress them. What impressed them was a loss of profit, and that entirely drove them to what they do. They physically grabbed Paul and Silas and brought them to the marketplace where the city rulers would be conducting their city business. And Luke uses exactly the right term here. It's a a word that only applies in very particular circumstances, the word that's translated as magistrates in the ESV here, for the kind of governing authority that was in charge in Philippi. He knew what he was talking about. He got the details right. Such small details demonstrate his direct personal knowledge and his trustworthiness as a reporter and as a historian. Continuing here in verse 20, Acts 16, 20, They said, the owners of the slave girl said to the magistrate, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Remember, there were not very many Jews in Philippi and perhaps no Jewish males, at least not enough to take any kind of leadership role there. And there was a large number of retired Roman soldiers there. And by and large, the Jews were not held in high esteem by Roman soldiers for a variety of reasons. Their views of the Jews was not positive. They readily pictured the Jews as troublemakers as a a category, and it was readily believed in that community. The only thing other than prejudice that Paul and Silas might have been advocating that was contrary to the Roman practices, they're advocating things that are not lawful for Romans to do, they said. The only thing that they might have been advocating that was in any sense contrary to Roman practice was the worship of God exclusively to worship God most high and him only. It wasn't wrong, according to Rome, to worship God, but there was a problem if you would not offer incense to Caesar. That got you into a difficulty when you would not acknowledge Caesar as a divine or semi-divine entity over the empire, over the Roman empire. So 
The fact that they advocated worshiping God exclusively and perhaps there was teaching about the kingdom, something like that that entered in. But these men said, not quite accurately, that they were teaching things that it's not lawful for Romans to accept or practice. And notice that they said us as Romans, because being a Roman colony, the citizens of that city were also born into Roman citizenship. As a Roman colony, the inhabitants were Roman citizens, and they embraced Roman customs, not local customs or regional norms. Verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave order to beat them with rods. This time, the persecution was economically motivated. Generally, the persecution that was reported in Acts up until this time, all the way up through chapter 15, had been resistance by Jews in various locations. And that's even been an issue inside the church. But generally up until now, the persecution has been as a result of Jews in various places resisting the transformation to the new covenant of Christ. This time, it's the Jewishness of Paul and Silas that was used to stir hostility against them. But the persecution was by a Roman mob under Roman authority and motivated by anger over the healing of a slave. Paul later wrote in 2 Corinthians about the numerous times that he was beaten in his travels. And in 2 Corinthians, written about seven years after this, 2 Corinthians 11, 25, he stated that along with a lot of other persecution he had been the recipient of, he had been beaten with rods three times. And so this is one of those three times that he was beaten with rods. And that would imply by civil authority. But one of the three times that he mentions there, he was undoubtedly beaten other times after he wrote Second Corinthians. But up until that point, three times he was beaten with rods. This is one of them. So Paul and Silas were beaten and handed over to the jailer for safekeeping. And don't miss the fact that their clothes were torn off of them in this process. Paul understood, or excuse me, the jailer. The jailer apparently understood that there was some apparent risk with these prisoners. And that would have been risk to himself if anything went wrong. And so he fastened them in stocks in the inner prison. He took special care that these prisoners would be secure. So we have Paul and Barnabas, Paul, excuse me. So we have Paul and Silas beaten and imprisoned, partly because they're Jewish and partly because they healed this girl, a miracle, imprisoned for doing a good work. This is reminiscent of what we've seen previously with Peter and John, with the apostles, when they were imprisoned because of doing good works, because of healing. Uh, We have consistency in the storyline of Acts all through this. And as they are there in the inner prison, under the the secure um, keeping of this jailer, we're going to see in the next episode, Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and following, that they did not lose heart. They were abused. They were mistreated. They had done a miracle. And rather than the miracle causing respect, it causes abuse. And in spite of that circumstance, they did not lose heart. They still focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. They continued in prayer and singing, as we'll read about in the next segment, Acts 16 and verse 25. So we're stopping with them in a bad place, but we'll pick up with how that bad circumstance turns into an opportunity to share their faith as we continue with the story of the Philippian jailer. 